much for coming to the workshop. Uh, my name is uh, Annie Luo, and I look after the media industry community at the World Economic Forum based out of New York. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for being here. And I want to thank uh, our colleague and partner at WIPO, Paolo Lanteri, for uh, co-hosting this workshop with us. And uh, of course, I wanted to thank uh, Ignacy Guardans, who is our moderator today, who is uh, as passionate about the creative industries as anyone I know. So, um, so maybe a, a few words before we start the session. Uh, for the past two years, the World Economic Forum, along with our industry partners in the media sector um, and McKinsey and Company, have been uh, looking at the co emerging consumer norms, behaviors, and values on the internet uh, really around the world and looking at their impact and implications for issues such as privacy, such as intellectual property, and uh, freedom of, of expression. So more specifically for the past year, we've really looked at uh, the future of digital copyright, and we tried to convene uh, various uh, groups of stakeholders in 2003, and try to frame the conversations, not so much uh, you know, as legal limitations, exceptions, but really about innovation and creativity, which I think you would agree is fundamental to the concept of copyright in the first place. So this year, we're expanding the conversation a little bit, and we're really looking at the innovative business models in the digital content ecosystem, the opportunities the internet presents to them, and the challenges. And these challenges could be linked to copyright, to legal issues, but could very well also link to technology and to social norms. So that's the topic that brings us here today and with our panel as well. We're hoping to, uh, to explore or some solutions, or at the very least, some ideas to, uh, to spark further conversation. Um, with that, I'd like to give the floor to Paolo from, uh, from the World Intellectual Property Organization, who will also say a few words. Thank you very much, Henny, and uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the workshop uh, on the business of creativity and focus on user-generated content uh, and IP. Only a few days ago, uh, we read on the news that Amazon uh, acquired and bought uh, Twitch, the live streaming uh, video games uh, platform, and uh, every single minute, more than 100 hours of videos are uploaded on YouTube, and every single day, up to 400 million pictures are posted on Facebook. All those are remarkable and impressive figures, and at the same time are also very good reason to discuss about UGC today. Uh, I think we can all appreciate the differences between uh, a video of my five years old cousin, uh, birthday party, where I try to sing uh, happy birthday to you in seven different languages, from another recording of another birthday, the 111 uh, birthday uh, and retirement of Bilbo Baggins in uh, the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. Uh, there are clear differences. One is good and, and one is bad, although it's still good fun to watch it. One has been improvised and done with homemade systems, uh, and the other one required a great uh, writer, Tolkien, then an, an amazing uh, director to adapt the novel into a movie. Hundreds of uh, actors and devoted uh, workers, a studio and massive investments. And yet, possibly the most clear difference is that uh, one was done without any purpose of making profit, and the other one is actually generating hundreds of millions of US dollars of, of, of revenues shared with a lot of people in the value chain. Um, so what, is, what are the major differences? We know that from economic, an economic perspective, both have value, uh, but we also understand from common, common sense perspective uh, that there are very different. In fact, both creation, both videos, uh, are in principle protected. Uh, copyright law applies to both. We don't, the originality requirement, which is generally very low, is the same. There is no obligation to comply with any formality. Uh, artistic merit is not a requirement for reaching the protection. So what does it mean in practical terms? It means that anyone involved in this business needs to ask several legal questions when looking at UGC. 
First, who owns what? Ownership. How does a platform get the rights to develop and deliver the service? This is usually done through terms of uses that are accepted by users. And what is the level of enforceability of those terms of uses? As we know well that in several legislation, uh, the requirements for the assignment and the transfer of copyrights are specific and quite high standards. Furthermore, what can we do with the content that has been uploaded in the US and then made available in EU where limitation exceptions apply in a different fashion? And finally, how do we make sure we are able to remunerate all the people that deserve a remuneration in all this, uh, this debate? So the question I, so at this point, most of you may well uh, decide to leave the room and go away, or if you decide to stay, you may ask yourself, why shall we discuss all these boring issues? Well, the answer is very, very simple, that legal certainty is a value and is crucial for building businesses and attract investment, not only for major players, but possibly more importantly for new startups that need to convince potential investors of the sustainability and uh, of the business. Uh, so today we are here basically to hear your opinion on whether Some, for some people, so is there a need to change something? A good answer can be no, we don't need a change. Or in case we do need a change, what, what can be done uh, in terms of legal, policy, uh, or technology uh, measures? Finally, let me uh, conclude by uh, introducing my organization, which is a United, is the World Intellectual Property Organization, is a United Nations agency with 127 member states and more than 300 NGOs participating in our meetings. Uh, that as, as one of the targets uh, uh, help, to help member states to develop a balanced IP framework. So today I think it's my duty and my firm belief that we should budget in in our debate also consideration specific to uh, developing countries and developing economies. And on the side of that, one may also argue that in terms of social networking and UGC uh, involvement of platforms, the differences between the developing and the developed world might be narrower in some sense than in many other issues in the currently discussed in the IP debate. With that, I wish you a very fruitful discussion. I pass the floor to Ignasi. Thank you very much. Thank you. This works. So welcome, everybody. And let me start, of course, by thanking the two organization hosts, the World Economic Forum and WIPO, for organizing this, for inviting us, for inviting me in particular, I can, uh, to have the possibility to share this time with you. So my name is Ignazi Guardans. I've been involved in the creative industries area for 20 years, uh, almost. Uh, both on the parliamentary side, I was in parliament working in these things at, mm, for many years in Spain and in Europe, a governmental side in charge of the Spanish Film uh, Audiovisual Agency, and uh, now, well, at other international fora, I mean at the uh, European Broadcasting Union and others, and now in private practice doing policy advice in a, from a law firm in, in, in Brussels. So I'm delighted to be here to be able to, to discuss this this very important element of of the business of creativity which is a perfect a perfect title <clears throat> a few a few months ago the european commission in brussels organized one of its open uh, consultation procedures uh, in the context many of you might be familiar of, with that of course in the context of a, a renovation a renewal a rethinking of intellectual property or copyright to be more precise copyright in the internet era that was the sort of general title of that well that was a historical process because never in the European Union history, never, uh, for any other topic, and you can imagine how many topics has the European Union been involved with, never did the European Commission receive as many replies as it has received here. 11,000 replies to a public consultation, each one of them grounded, depth, with arguments, and with a position. That had never happened. Of course, a bunch of, 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 uh, of uh, 
civil servants had to go through all those replies, process them all. The result of all those materials is online. You can find it at, at the European Commission website. But it just shows you the, the interest, how much important this topic is. How do we deal with copyright? How do we deal with rights management at the internet era? And of course, a reading of this document, which summarizes horizontally the different replies received from users, from uh, user, from rights owners, from broadcasters, from, uh, of course, uh, internet service providers, and from others, from governmental agencies and so on, shows how different the positions are, and uh, even the basics are not taken for granted. So it's very difficult to have a discussion when even certain things cannot be agreed upon. I think at least here we can, we can agree about uh, some basics. We can agree that the internet as a structure and everything which is the structural part of internet is essential. But we can also agree that the, those pipelines are nothing without the content which travels through it. Hmm? What are the pipelines used for if there's nothing, uh, nothing going through it? So the importance of content is very clear. Then we must agree, or we can agree here as well, about the importance of creativity behind that content. But creativity is an industry. It is a hobby for many, of course, and that's one of the points here about user-generated content, because the, the border is blurred. Hmm? But it is certainly an industry. Some of you might be surprised to learn that in Europe, those are the figures I know, but it, it applies everywhere as proportionally, but in Europe, the creative industry is larger than the chemical industry. The creative industry represents 4% of Europe's GDP. So there are more jobs in the creative industry than in the whole chemical industry in Europe, more than in the construction industry in Europe. Of course, not, that, not all of that includes online creative industries. So we are talking, it, it's larger. It includes performance, culture, other things, media. But it gives you an idea that we are not talking about something which is funny. We are talking about jobs and about businesses and a lot of businesses behind. So that's the first thing we, can, we, we, we have a, a panel here to, to discuss about. How do we deal with that in the internet era? How do we monetize that content? How can we really have legal certainty, as Pablo was mentioning, the basics to have a business is legal certainty. The basics is to have a secure legal framework. Otherwise, there's no possibility at all to make a business, to make an investment. And very specifically, and that's the topic, uh, the, the subtopic in our, in our panel, what happens with this new sort of content which appears online, which is the so-called user-generated content, in which the border between professional creation and unprofessional creation is blurred, but there is a border. Because it is, it is a reality that part of that user-generated content might have an economic value, unexpectedly sometimes for those who created it, expectedly in other times, and in any case, it is creating a value for others who are benefiting from that user-generated content in business terms. So there is a certain conflict of interest there between those who create professionally, those who create non-professionally but may become professional creators, those who are benefiting from non-professional content, who should or should not, but probably should be remunerating that non-professionally created content. So there is a whole area there, which is, uh, of course, very, very important uh, now, and it's, it's the topic we're going to discuss. And for that, we we have a very interesting panel, and I'm just jump into the presentation. We will start. I will introduce each one of the speakers uh, when he she takes the floor. So let's start with Nuri. I don't know if I pronounce it properly. Kolakoglu. Cholakoglu. Cholakoglu. Okay. Nuri Cholakoglu. He's the chairman uh, of Dogan Media International. So from the host country, I would say. He has a very long uh, experience as a journalist, broadcaster, media executive, uh, and he um, will start the conversation with us. The floor is yours. Is it? Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, being the Turkish panelist here, I would like to welcome you to Istanbul. And I'm sorry to see that you're sitting in this dark room instead of enjoying the beautiful weather outside and strolling around the, the city or walking up and down the buses. But there you are. That comes with the package. Well, I think the problem we are trying to address arises from the fact that we are living in a world where technology moves far faster than the legal regulations and arrangements. 
And every time somebody leaps, uh, somebody tries to set up a legal framework for anything that's happening in this world, then technology finds a way to beat around it and jump the queue. And actually, uh, when we are talking about internet, I think it's going, it's, it will be one of the main milestones of the civilization if we see civilization and accrue of all the past experiences because the first milestone was probably the creation of writing which managed to leave people their ideas be fine when they go. The second was the printing which able to spread these ideas on a larger scale and internet really made everyone a contributor to the civilization because anything you say or think or write on the web is there to stay and it's open to the benefit of anyone who cares to look at it. And this is so much so in a country like Turkey which is not technologically so much uh, advanced as the other westernized country, Western countries. But we see that internet is picking up very quickly. Right now, we have about 53% of the population have access to internet. 91% uh, of those use Google. Uh, Facebook users are about 78% of all those who access to internet and they spent about 12 hours 48 minutes weekly per month or with the Facebook. I mean the numbers are staggering and social media of course is uh, bursting. Uh, you've probably heard about the Gezi incidents last year and uh, last year on 19, 20 and 21st of May uh, 17,000 tweets were sent every minute, 17,000 per minute. And in Turkey we have about uh, 13 million Twitter users and loads of tweets are coming back and forth. This is becoming a major instrument in democratization. But unfortunately, internet right now is contributing more to democracy than to the economy because so far nobody has really created a major formula to convert this incredible numbers into money, how to monetize this. And the only thing I see on the money side you moving is the increase of advertisement. I'm a conventional media person, started off as a journalist, went on to radio, then to television, and ended up as an executive of media. Uh, we try to see bucks somewhere, but uh, internet advertisement about seven or eight years ago was 1%. Today it's gone over to 12% and it is the second largest uh, source where the advertisement is heading to after the television. Television is number one and it, every day we see internet uh, stealing away from the traditional media like the print media or the op uh, open air or the cinema, etc. So the way to create funding for these internet content is the biggest problem right now. And so much so in Turkey, we don't have much trouble with the copyrights as far as it's concerned. I mean, uh, we do not go into major legal battles. Uh, from time to time, for example, initially the newspapers uh, try to gag the internet uh, producers from refraining using newspapers materially other than their own newspaper sites, but that has been sold in a rather amicable way. But uh, creating unique content which nobody else can replicate or converting that into money is becoming a big game. And as the attention span of the 
internet users, because we see more and more younger people moving into the realm of internet, the material has to be reformatted to suit the needs of these younger people whose attention span is about two minutes, three minutes. That's, that's the great interest in YouTube because nothing lasts more than six minutes on YouTube. Of course, creation of YouTube channels and getting paid from those YouTube channels is going to be the thing, but still I'm afraid we have some more time to go to convert that into money and to legalize the ownership of those materials. Because as Ignacy has indicated, who owns what? How do you register? I mean, in Turkey, if you try to, or in the United States, if you want to show a film, there are lots of institutions who have already established the ownership of the films or the series, or etc. And the moment you step the, over the red line, you'll immediately see a legal action being promoted. But with the smaller stuff that come in from the internet users are not that easy to track and to find. I think whoever finds a great way of monetizing this content in an intelligent way, and I see the uh, YouTube channels as a way out on that road, is uh, going to be the, one of the leading figures in the media in the coming days. I'll stop here and continue in the second round. Perfect. Thank you. Marie, there will be time to come back to that. I leave a question floating to you, but you don't answer that. You answer that afterwards. I mean, do you receive user-generated content and do you pay for it? That's the question I'm putting to you. No, uh, give, give it no you don't pay for the user-generated that's, content. That's right. Think, think about how much do you receive from the public in terms of, of content generated by the users, by your viewers and so on, and what, what are you doing with that? But I would... You, you keep that question okay. for later, okay? Just... Uh, so we move to the other side of the table, Glenn. Glenn Dean is Director of Networking and Distribution Technology for NBC Universal. He has a long career related to, if I'm not wrong, uh, the technical part of everything we are discussing here. Uh, he holds himself several patents in the area of digital content, applied cryptography, networking, and scalable distributed computing. And he's been working with standards organizations related to internet. And of course, well, he has all this experience about what can be done, what should be done, what cannot be done, which is also interesting because sometimes we hear proposals which are totally impossible and infeasible, and that's also interesting to, <laughs> to hear about. So uh, the floor is yours, Glenn. Uh, thank you uh, for having me here today, and thank you for taking a few minutes to hear me uh, talk about my little corner of the world. I'm going to start with taking issue with something you said a few minutes ago, which was that there's a, uh, there's a border between uh, professional content and user-generated content. I don't see a firm border. Uh, what I see is a, a change that the internet's brought upon us as a society where we are moving away from a one-directional model where professional creators create and then everybody else consumes to a new model where we all create and we all consume. Sometimes we create awful things. I created yesterday. I took some photographs of this beautiful city and posted them on Facebook. I'm not a very good photographer, and I use an iPhone, which has an okay camera, but it's not a professional quality. Uh, but I'm a creator, and I create it on the internet. Uh, other people, I'm sure, created uh, very similar content and published it and are now uh, even getting revenue for it. Uh, they may have uploaded a video to YouTube and monetized it, uh, a little personal travel log video or, or their personal introduction to the city, uh, which is very valuable and I watched several of them before I came to Istanbul to discover a little bit about the town. Uh, and they monetized it. And you know, they range from very poor quality to actually some very, very good quality. On the other end, of course, we have big production uh, movies from studios like mine, NBC Universal, where you have uh, you know productions that cost millions of dollars. They employ uh, 
easily, in many cases, hundreds of people uh, from all walks of life, from actors to writers to caterers to people at paint sets. Uh, but when you look at the whole thing, it's a spectrum of content that gets created and shared on the internet. It isn't user-generated versus professional content. It's an end-to-end -end spectrum of stuff that all matters. And I point this out because it's interesting, you know, and I'll talk in a minute about technology, but it's interesting that that changes, I think, the dynamic that we look at, uh, the concept of ownership, the concept of creation, and the concept of consumption. Because it used to be easy to say, I don't create, I just view. Those guys are the ones that are creating. Those are the guys who have to worry about all these issues about managing content and distributing it and how do I do that properly. Um, because I don't do that, I'm just a consumer. I'm no longer just a consumer. I'm a creator. And so are all of you. I saw as I sat down here and we got ready to go that several iPhones popped up and photographs were taken of us. Congratulations, you now own a copyright. <laughs> We're being filmed right now. Congratulations, you're all actors in this uh, stage. Uh, the world's changed, and you know we're still evolving a lot of the ways we handle that. One of the ways I like to talk, uh, since I'm a technologist, not a policymaker or, or a, uh, an attorney lawyer, uh, is technology is changing too. Um, where if we went back in the past, when we looked at the tools that people use to create content, uh, there was a clear border. There was professional cameras which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. There were editing suites and systems that they used in the professional world to create content. And then there was the stuff that we all carried around in our back pockets, 35 millimeter cameras in the old day and pocket cameras on 110 film if you go back that far. That changed too. Just like I talked a few minutes ago about my iPhone taking photographs and movies, I can take very high quality movies and uh, photographs now with c what we consider consumer grade equipment. We have cameras out there in the hands of consumers that are creating 4K content. And for those people not familiar with 4K in the term, 4K is the next generation above uh, HD. We've all just spent the last decade buying new TVs to get HD content. Um, and the industry has spent a lot of time and, and money uh, revamping its sets and, and its cameras to be HD cameras. Uh, we are now on the new frontier. We're all going to 4K. This is uh, four times the amount of information per screen, four times the number of pixels per screen that uh, a standard or HD has. We're seeing this uh, already, people creating 4K content and publishing it to YouTube. Before the studios themselves are publishing 4K content on places like television channels. So clearly the lines have blurred between what is professional and what is not professional because we now have non-professionals creating content in advance in some standards areas from the studios themselves. We see this in other areas too. We see the line blurring between the technology used to edit and compile stuff. We see user-generated content now that actually involves multiple cameras and actors. We see uh, people doing user-generated content where they're writing scripts ahead of time and actually starting to produce what would look like a film production. Sometimes they even have to pay for catering themselves. The, the lines really got blurry. One of the things I would like to draw attention to is that we need um, some support in the standards world to enable this to be even better and to build technical frameworks to allow us to manage content on the internet that allow policy people to eventually decide the new policies around making this world thrive and grow uh, and uh, allowing each of us when we create and distribute our content to get it out there and be, get it seen because as a creator your number one goal is to let people see what you've created. Uh, in my business as a professional studio the more eyeballs that watch a piece of uh, content in a theater or on TV, cable or the internet the better because eyeballs are consumers and as a personal creator the more people I get to share my experience the better because hey, that's what we're all about. We're a social community and we like to share what we've done. So one of the things I like to draw attention to is that video is kind of unique if you look at it from a technical standards perspective. Every other sort of technology we use on the internet today is really dependent upon one or two standards groups to creating it. The IETF, which I spend a lot of time working with, uh, and, and I, I encourage you to support because they do great work, is out there creating the protocols for moving the data between devices on the internet and making sure it arrives there securely and reliably. 
We have W3C that creates the standards around the browser and how things will appear when we look at the browser and, and interact with the internet. When I look at video, however, it's getting a lot more complex. We have the ITF, certainly the very, very important. We have W3C, incredibly important. Uh, we also have groups like uh, SIMT, which is the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, that worry about uh, specifications for things like what does HD look like and how do you transmit it. We have uh, groups like MPEG that create the encodex and the encoding standards. We, by the way, have many more groups that create other encoding and codex standards. Uh, we recently took account of uh, some stuff in our own studio and realized that we transcode into about 40 different formats when we actually distribute our piece of content. And uh, uh, we heard down here that people, when you publish on the internet, also have to worry about transcoding and getting into the format people want to consume it. One of the things I like to put in the idea in your head is, in addition to new policies, I think we also need some new technical work done to uh, build some fundamental frameworks on the internet to allow content to be richer and better distributed and better found and better accessed. Simple things like uh, methods for uniquely identifying content. Uh, today, if I want to say watch a video of uh, Paolo on the beach, I have no way of naming that. I have no way of searching for it. And if he's in a different language when he posted his video, I as an English language speaker have a problem. I don't know how to search for those terms. I don't speak other languages. If somebody posts it in Portuguese, I don't know how to search for it in Portuguese. If we had simple things like universal naming conventions that could be built upon uh, and used by open standards groups then to build things for managing metadata around this content to allow for better search and discovery and for better ways of associating other pieces of content with works that have been created and shared. Uh, I think we'd actually have some fundamental building blocks that would be wonderful for people to innovate and build around. And so one of the efforts I myself would like to draw attention to is, is a thing that I, I champion a lot called the glass to glass internet ecosystem, which is the idea of bringing together uh, technical experts from uh, around the internet to sit down and talk about how they would like to see content created and from a technical perspective, created, managed, edited, and flowing through all the way through the internet ecosystem until consumption. And then worry about what things we can do to innovate around making standards-based technology that allows you to interact and grow and build new uh, models and new delivery platforms on top of that. And if anybody would like to hear more about that, please see me after the session. <laughs> but there, there's my little sales pitch. Um, and I'll turn the floor over. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, you said you were not going to be provocative, but you are provocative. Because, in fact, if there's nothing like, uh, I'm going to be provocative with you now. Huh? But, of course, if there's no frontier, no border between professional creation and non-professional creation, and at the end of the day, we are all creators and we are all sharing, why should somebody invest in a professional creating company such as a studio, instead of really investing in the platforms who are really the ones who are there to put all those things together. So, so what would be the point of really uh, growing? So, yeah, you could, since you have time, let's, let's uh, still use your time. Well, I, I think you would still invest in studios because there are some things that you can get only from a studio. If you look at uh, you know, a great Disney film that's out this year, The Guardians of the Galaxy, I don't know if it's open to everywhere if anybody's had a chance to see it. I don't work for NBC, or I work for NBC, so not Disney, so I'm giving a plug to them. Great movie. You could not produce that. All of us in this room together could not produce that, even if we wanted to, because that is the combining of a set of skills and abilities that are truly artistic in nature and truly very high-end skills that are unique. And you could not do that unless you had a studio that could invest the time and bring together those artists to make that happen. And it's downright good entertainment. And I think that's going to stick with us forever, because storytelling is part of our foundation as a, as a people. But on the other end, you're still going to have people like me going to Istanbul to talk on a panel and uh, taking pictures of the Bosphorus and posting it on Facebook to say, hey, I'm here. Look at the cool stuff I found and interact with today. But you can have both. It's not a this or that. It's a both exist. Well, certainly. It is an answer that's, I mean, I'm just here to, to <laughs> pull a little bit the strings. So indeed, that's, that's an issue. Of course, if you look at this from the author's perspective, 
the author, the script writer of a short film, uh, I mean a short, uh, a cheaper film, and the script writer of Quadrants of the Galaxy, the work from the script writer is more or less the same. It's, the, 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 it's everything, I mean, what, what is bigger is everything else, not the, not the pure creativity work behind that. But that would be a, a debate if, if just professional creation is to be restricted to just large productions. Anyway, you mentioned another issue which is also, I find, very, very important, which is, is not exactly represented here. Uh, which you, you mentioned the standards problem and the issue of... Uh, interoperability between between standards which is a very important issue for another sector of, of creativity which is publishing hmm? uh, indeed that's a, that's a, that's a very important topic uh, not not all the industries so there's a little bit more of audiovisual here than than other creative industries so not all the creative industries could be represented in this panel but indeed that's an issue again uh, an important issue in terms of how user-generated content, which would be independent publishing, so to say, can get into the general uh, distribution channels without being formatted in a way which allows you to be distributed through the main channels, not to mention any particular com company or, uh, or format now. So that's, that's an issue which is on the table, the standards, the formats, and the interoperation between them. It applies to the visual, but it applies very, very strongly to the publishing sector now. Okay, so let's move to the third speaker here, who is, of course, the element, uh, I mean, representing here the element, the platform, where all this is happening, or part of all this is happening, Facebook. So Sarah Wynn Williams is Director of Public Policy of Facebook, based in Washington, D.C. She has a long experience in the area of public policy and international affairs uh, from different, different angles, and for, uh, for a while she's been putting all that experience at the service of Facebook. So you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so I think there's no argument that the internet's triggered a, a boom in availability, quantity, diversity um, of content that's both created and consumed. And I, I don't hear much argument that that's, that's a bad thing. So that it's more, we're trying, and I think often this debate is pitted as, you know, content creators versus platforms versus other interests. Um, and I think what's been positive about the panel so far is that we've really brought out the areas of complementarity, right? And um, as the last speaker said, it's not necessarily a trade-off or a choice between a studio-produced um, movie and user-generated con uh, content. There, the, the, this is both content, it's different types of content. One doesn't necessarily mean the demise of the other. Um, and in fact, actually, we're, we're seeing an increasing amount of complementarity across platforms. So there was a, a study released earlier this year that said that one in six TV viewers who are viewing television in prime time are using social media while they're, while they're watching television. So you've got two forms of content, you've got a different form of interaction there. And I think what um, what's interesting is that platforms um, like Twitter, like Facebook, they're lowering, they're lowering the barriers between creators and consumers. So um, you know, some of the things that these tools give you is the ability to have continuous feedback on content. So, and this is allowing a channel between the creators of content and the consumers of content. And on our platform, that's you know through likes and shares, but there's also a back end to it. So you're also, you know, content creators are also able to get analytics. They're able to get data. They're able to understand um, what demographics, you know, so if you're watching I'm about to embarrass myself because I'm trying to think of something trashy that if you're watching there that I and I haven't watched television in a while. Um, so if you're watching The Bachelor, you can see you know is it mainly w women who are interacting on you know discussing this content on social media? Is it men? What age group? So the way that we look at it is we're sort of expanding both the um, the type of content, but also the data and analytics behind it. Um, and that's going to give creators a deeper understanding of their audience and hopefully allow them to sort of tune, fine tune and improve the content that's out there. Um, not only are we closing the distance between creators and consumers, um, but we're also creating tools um, that we hope are, are sort of 
bringing the, the distance between professionals and amateurs, we're, that we're hoping to reduce that distance, basically, um, and to reduce the distance between industry-generated content and user-generated content. And to give you an example, um, last week, Instagram released Hyperlapse. I'm not sure if anyone has had the opportunity to use it. If, if you haven't, I, I'd really encourage you. It's, it's incredibly fun. You'd be able to get a, good, a lot of great Hyperlapse videos whilst you're out and about in Turkey. Um, but the, the way that this app was described was like, um, and this is by wide, as I said, it's like having a $15,000 video in your hand. And that's an app that's for free. Anyone can use it. And you're being given a tool that, that previously um, was only possible for people who had a steady cam or a $15,000 tracking rig. Um, now anyone who has an iPhone can have it for free. So it's um, the way we look at this is innovations like this are lowering the barriers to entry for amateurs um, and increasing the amount of content and the quality of that content that's out there. Um, I mean, our, our view is that that's great for creators and consumers, um, primarily for three reasons. Lowering the, um, the barriers to entry for creators, um, it gives you know, these marketing and production tools to amateurs, and it means a greater number and more diverse set of creators can now reach and cultivate audiences. And they can use platforms like uh, Facebook and Twitter. I mean, we have over a billion people on Facebook. So not only are you given the tool through something like Hyperlapse, you're also given the distribution to this, you know, billion wide audience. Um, the second reason is that lowering these barriers between creators and consumers, it's, it means there's higher quality and more relevant content, um, more finely targeted audiences, because creators are incorporating this continuous and instant feedback and combining that with the powerful analytics that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then I think the blurring of distinction between user and industry generated content, it makes uh, content richer because it's giving professionals access to information aggregated by, um, from amateurs and amateurs have the ability of reaching audiences traditionally reserved for professionals. So you hear a lot of stories about people who post a YouTube video, get discovered, it's the, it's the pathway to building up a, a large fan base. Um, and given this is all relatively new, um, the role of companies um, like ours and platforms like ours in creative production, is, it's undergoing a significant transformation and that's part of the work that the World Economic Forum is trying to do. Um, we don't view ourselves as a gatekeeper between creators and consumers. Platforms like ours actually try to minimize our role um, in editorial, marketing, financing, production decisions. What, what we're trying to do is provide the tools um, so that creators manage those decisions and those responsibilities themselves and they reach out directly to the audience. So we, we try and have creators as, as limited friction in that interaction as possible. Um, basically what we want to do is empower individuals and then get out of the way, let, let them reach their audiences. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I look at this through the public policy lens because that's my interest and my passion, but I think the public policy framework has been key to making this happen. Um, the way that, um, I mean, we, we can get in, uh, maybe in the discussion we'll get more into sort of the, the precise intellectual property framework, but I think, the balance that, it, that is there has facilitated the sort of boom and increase in, uh, in accessibility for people. Um, I think one of the things that we get concerned about are the sort of challenges to more, the, the idea of more restrictive policies that are out there. Um, so legislation that's, you know, makes it hard to display snippets of news content or that creates um, liability for linking to external content um, or that limits, I mean, there are um, a number of initiatives which try to, to limit the ability for this free, free flow of information. And to, 
to my mind, throwing up these new roadblocks against this open and exchange, uh, this open flow of content, um, it counteracts these positive effects that the internet. So we've lowered all these barriers, and we we risk the the setup where we're throwing up more. Um, I think part of the gains that we've we've managed to secure. Um, it's been made possible because we've had this freedom to experiment. We've had the, these you know, evolving and constantly changing models of creating, conveying, and cataloging content. And, and that, you know, that can change so quickly. So something like Hyperlapse can be a, a game changer. I don't know what the next app is going to be that comes out, but these things are constantly evolving. And it's really important that we keep the space for this innovation to continue. Um, so. You know, for you know, our view is that public policy should be geared towards allowing continued experimentation, uh, continued experimentation and innovation, um, and through that space that that public policy creates, we'll hopefully be able to continue to build a creative ecosystem, um, where which includes professionals, amateurs, creators, and consumers. Thank you. Well, you do. You did open here several, several areas for discussion later. Uh, I have a question which you can reply now or perhaps later when we reopen the issue. I mean, aren't we mixing or confusing a little bit the concept of, of lowering the barrier, which is one thing. There is a barrier between amateur and amateur. You lower the barrier, so you make it easier than it was before, the access to professional content, to, to being a professional creator, I mean. One is thing is that, to lower the barrier. The other is, to take away the barrier and to have no barrier at all, meaning no difference at all between being somebody who lives out of creation and somebody who doesn't live out of creation. Because when you do that, and it wouldn't be a Facebook problem, I mean, I'm saying it's, it's a moral problem. Well, when, how, how do you invest in creation if there's no return for that, if there's no legal security for that, if there's no way to have that money back? So it's not exactly the same to lower the barrier, which is a democratic principle, to, to stop this idea that only elite people can have access to publishing or to creating or to making movies. Everybody can. But once you decide from bottom that you want to make your living out of that, you want to make your living. And for that, you need some legal security return monetization fee. If that doesn't exist, and it's permanently confused between who is living out of that and who is just making that up for fun, well, we might have a problem in terms of having a business model and then having creation there. I would put that on the, on the table for, for debate. But we move to uh, all respect to the other speakers on the table, to the most intellectual part of our speakers. <laughs> Uh, Andres Guadamuz, who is the lecturer in intellectual property law at the University of Sussex. He has spent a lot of time analyzing these things, publishing about these things, and thinking about these things. So we want to hear from you. Uh, he's a lecturer at the University of Sussex, as I said, also an associate researcher at the Creative Center for Copyright and New Business Models and Creative Economy. So you are the right man at the right place. The floor is yours. Uh, Thanks. Uh, oh, yeah. that's uh, uh, a lot of responsibility uh, to, to uh, for me to to be introduced as an in uh, intellectual part of the conversation, and I think I'm going to disappoint you right away. So <laughs> maybe if we can have the at the back. Yes, uh, I'll disappoint you right away with uh, the famous uh, monkey selfie. Who I've been told, Glenn uh, pointed out uh, that he, uh, he's not a monkey; it's an ape. And it's a she, apparently, as well. So, so uh, it, it's uh, 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 take of that as, uh, as you may. I am a storyteller. Um, uh, besides uh, uh, doing intellectual uh, uh, discourse in, in, in some of this, I like telling stories. And I think it's one of the reasons uh, sometimes I get invited to these things. Uh, and I wanted to tell the story of the monkey because I think there is a point. Uh, it exemplifies uh, the, the, a, a lot of the things that we need to look at, revisit in the digital age. Now, uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure if uh, everyone is familiar with uh, the story of, of, of uh, the ape. Sorry. Uh, uh, 
It, it was a picture taken in Indonesia by a professional uh, photographer uh, 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 that travels uh, 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 to different places and takes uh, n nature uh, pictures called uh, David Slater. He is uh, English. And he took this uh, picture of its uh, crested black macaque uh, uh, monkey or ape. Um, the story of this is that he was uh, uh, taking pictures of, of, uh, of the group of, uh, of, uh, of uh, apes. And he noticed that a couple of them were very interested in his photographic equipment. Uh, then, so he set it up in a way that uh, they would come and, and they started playing with it. And they liked the fact that they could see their image in the lens and then started playing with it. And uh, this particular one took about 300 pictures, uh, of which uh, there are others, but this is, uh, I think, everyone's favorite. There is one where the monkey is serious. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep calling it monkey, or, uh, 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 even though it's not scientifically accurate. Um, it started taking about 300 pictures, and uh, this was uh, these and two others were were, were selected by uh, uh, by the photographer, and they were first published in the Daily Mail, which is uh, 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 perhaps I shouldn't say this uh, on record, but it's a horrible uh, newspaper in the UK. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it went viral; everyone started sharing the pictures, uh, etc. It, 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 uh, people started putting it as their avatar, their Facebook picture. Yeah, it, it was it was uh, quite a phenomenon. Now. Uh, the the actual picture uh, was posted in uh, Wikipedia and, and uh, uh, as part of a uh, Wikimedia Commons, and uh, there was a very interesting discussion on copyright following uh, within the, the community, and they looked at some uh, U.S. case law and U.S. articles in Wikipedia because that's how you make this legal decisions nowadays uh, by looking at the Wikipedia article, and they decided that the picture is in the public domain. Now, uh, the photographer started seeing this and wanted, uh, you, you can imagine the possibilities to monetize something like this. It's, uh, it's very popular. You can turn it into posters, uh, uh, t-shirts, all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, all, all, all power to him. I actually don't begrudge him at all uh, for that. But uh, the claim that in order to be able to monetize this is that this picture should have copyright. Right now, I want to have a show of hands. Uh, who thinks that there is copyright in this picture? Oh, very small minority. Yeah, um, uh, and and I think yeah. Uh, so it's it's it's, a, it's still a minority. Uh, the the. Debate has been framed uh, recently uh, a lot in, in, in news uh, uh, websites and, and, and news sources uh, by the fact that the U.S. Copyright Office made a, a statement uh, when, when a journalist asked, apparently, because uh, they cannot ex officio declare the, the ownership of the copyright. Uh, they, uh, they made a statement. This was taken by, the, uh, by an animal. Uh, animals do not have rights uh, in that respect, so it, it, it cannot have copyright. But uh, it, it was interesting uh, because it shows, I think, a lot of the problems that we're having in the internet age. This was taken, as I was saying, in Indonesia. It was, uh, it, it's, uh, he's a, a, a UK citizen, so, uh, European copyright law, which is uh, highly harmonized because of the European directives, would apply, but also UK uh, case law. And if you look at the US case law, and I think US law, probably you would be right that the threshold of originality of what constitutes an original work is very high in the United States because of the case law that has been taken place there. But I think in Europe, and specifically in uh, in the UK, there would be a very strong case for this to have copyright. Because when we're thinking about digital photography, it's less important nowadays who actually pulls the, uh, the trigger, pushes the button, presses the screen, that creates the work. Uh, the selfies are a good example of this, the actual act of just 
putting your hand out and pressing the screen. Is that enough work, uh, what used to be skill and labor, enough to, to, to uh, uh, gr uh, grant someone copyright? Uh, what if I gave my camera to someone and to ask uh, to take a picture of the panel? Uh, you're taking the picture, but you know it's my equipment, etc. There are all sorts of very interesting questions that I think the, the, this asks that we are not answering completely, uh, you would have to go to court. Now, so far, uh, the, the, the photographer would like to have copyright in, 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 in this picture, uh, eventually, and he he's sent not cease and desist letters, uh, but he sent letters to Wikimedia and to other uh, forum uh, asking them to take down the picture, and they have not complied so far. I think that if he sued, at least in, in, in a court in, uh, in, in the UK, he would be successful. I, I, I think that there is a very strong case, particularly because of the circumstances. He, he set up the camera in a way that would lure the monk into taking the picture. So there was a, an action, and, and, and UK and European legislation say very clearly that the act of originality, the act of creation, is not it's part of what happens before and after is the preparation, uh, but also the selection. And there is a, a, a case law uh, in that respect that uh, the act of selecting works, and in this case, out of 300 pictures, the ones that, that were iconic, that, were, that we love, and we love them so much that, that we keep sharing it and, and people laugh every time you show the monkey. Uh, I don't know, it's a cheap shot when you're presenting. But, uh, but anyway, uh, I think that this shows the very act of creation. It doesn't matter that the, the, the photographer was the one that, pre that pressed the button. Now, what, I do have a point. And the point is that I think that all of this exemplifies that that we have to revisit user-generated content. We have to revisit the very basic uh, of, of creation uh, of what we consider to be originality, for example, because, we, because if something as basic as this, of whether or not a monkey pressing a button in a camera constitutes copyright, if, we, if that is not harmonized, then w uh, you can analyze as many different aspects of copyright in the digital age that are not harmonized, and uh, exceptions and limitations. The existence of fair use in the United States that we, uh, uh, in many other countries, envy. It, it's, 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 well, I consider it fabulous. Some people don't like it. But uh, things like that, that are very basic to the idea of what constitutes uh, uh, copyright protection. Uh, things that would allow uh, fair use in, in the United States would not constitute a, a fair use in, in, in most other jurisdictions. Uh, things like uh, the UK just passed a set of exceptions and limitations uh, that are quite wide ranging. For example, in things like data mining that are very interesting. That is only in one jurisdiction and th are things that are uh, very relevant to researchers around the world. And only one country has legislated on this. This is how uh, the harmonization process happens. But I think this is the time where we have to re-examine all of this. And the poster boy for, for new harmonization golden era, I think, I think it's our friend, the ape. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Really, you, you, you opened an area which, of course, the detailed issue about harmonizing uh, copyright in this, in this field, which, in fact, the debate is whether it needs to be changed or it needs to be re reinterpreted with the same laws as they are. So before we open the floor, I would like uh, some sort of, of short, short interaction here. I would have one question. You can reply to the question or to anything else, but at least I put a question. So, uh, from what we have we have seen and what you already you have said yourselves, does the policy and laws need to be changed? I mean, is there anything specifically which needs to be changed to be adapted to this new situation, user-generated content, the new concept of what is creation, what is not creation, what is professional? Does it need to be really changed? or the framework is enough as it is, and we just need to approach it in a different way? Or you really think that laws and, and, and structures need to be changed? You can reply to that and go a little bit forward, and then we open the, the floor. Well, in my mind, I think <clears throat> the most important thing, you will, would need a registry for any right 
I mean, for books we have, for cinemas we have, for music we have, we have registry showing the ownership. Unless you cannot very verifiably prove the ownership, no right can be asked about it. So I think the next big thing in the internet would be a registry of the intellectual property. I mean, if you come in with this monkey a picture and register it as yours and legitimately you can prove that it's yours, then you can claim your rights over it. And I think the next big Facebook or Google will be the person who will be registering all these and put up an army of so lawyers behind it to follow the rights over it. Just, just one comment in between. You can all, and you're encouraged to tweet. Huh? So we won't, you won't be blamed if we see yourself playing with your computers or your, your phones here, and, and you tweet about this session. The session, I should have said that at the start, but anyway, the session is being not only recorded, but broadcasted live. And in fact, there's going to be, there is remote participation. So we will receive input from, from outside this room. Uh, which will we open in a second. So to, let's just finish this short uh, final panel thing. And you're also welcome to post on Facebook as well as Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> One zero, touche. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, in to, in to answer your question, I mean, I think it's, you know, part of what it, the innovation has been able to happen because the space in the current framework is there. Um, I think issues around monetization um, and how you're going to re remunerate people who create the content, that's going to evolve. Whether that needs to happen um, through legal frameworks, I, I'm not convinced that it needs to rise to the legislative level because I think part of, um, part of what makes the internet succeed is that the ability to, to nimbly pivot um, and identify gaps and address those. So I think um, the, the f existing framework is sufficient, but I think practices and monetization will evolve. It's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think one change that is going to happen, because we've started seeing little bits and pieces of it, and that is that the, the community of people that are all, includes all, all of us are starting to wake up to the fact that um, it's not a discussion about professionals being on one side and the rest of us being on another side of the concept of copyright. Uh, we're all copyright holders. And this is becoming an issue that is relevant to all of us. You know, if I take a photograph, uh, just me, and I put it up on a Facebook page or I put it up on my own personal web page, what happens to that after that? And, and what can other people do with it? And I think it becomes a very relevant question as we, as a community of internet users, or become a community of internet content creators, we all have a stake in it. And I think, I don't know if, that means we need to change anything, but I think it means that we need to uh, view the dialogue in a different way. It's not all of us consumers against the creators, it's all of us creators. And what do we want? Very shortly, so yeah. we open the floor. Uh, uh, I think I mentioned this. I, I, I think that uh, e even if it's not a legislative uh, solution or even a treaty or a harmonization process, we need to have a discussion at the, uh, at the basic level of what uh, what are the basics of what constitutes a, a creation. Uh, because it's becoming very easy for everyone to create, and I think uh, the panel has given a lot of examples of, of how easy it's, it, it is to, to, to create things nowadays. And it's so becoming so easy that, uh, that we are in danger of not meeting what used to be the requirement of, uh, for, for, for copyright protection. And I think uh, if we have these discussions, uh, we, we have to look at licenses, the, the, the change of the licensing uh, environment, and the act of sharing, how the economy now is an economy of sharing. All sorts of these discussions n need not be legislative, but we need to have them. Thank you. We open the floor. Uh, the floor opens in a tricky way. It opens with one question, which I know that the person who was here wanted to put it. So David, David Fairs from 21st Century Fox, uh, you open the floor with a the question there, and then we go for the rest. 
Thank you. If, if I can actually make a few remarks and then pose the question based on those remarks. I think, you know, Sarah mentioned the fact that Facebook has democratized content production and distribution. Again, I think we have to go to what Ignacio and Nuri both said, and that is, how do you monetize it? Because if you want to, if your passion is content creation, and you want to make a career out of that, simply distributing it without any sort of uh, ability to monetize it is going to be a barrier for your ability to move to the next stage from amateur to professional. I think if you, as a, as a company that is a content producer, there are two policies that are critically important to us. One is the freedom of expression, because without that freedom of expression, we can't produce the content that might challenge a government, that might you know, tell a very difficult story that, that would be, you know, if the government's going to censor that, we wouldn't be able to create that compelling content. And the other is copyright, because that's what allows us to monetize the content. And I think you have to build both of those into the legal framework, and you need to have both of those being enforceable. And so I wonder how we go about, if we don't need to change the legal framework, Sarah, how do we go about facilitating the monetization. And to Nuri's point, what are the barriers to monetization on the internet from amateur and moving to professional? And the one other thing I would like to flag, I think there have been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of talk on the panel regarding technical standards. And I'm not sure if any of you are aware of the, dig, of the copyright hub that is being created in the UK, which would actually make an interoperable system of metadata to identify who the owners of the copyright are, so that you then might be able to build on that a licensing framework. It would, it's all voluntary. But I wonder how that would fit into the questions and challenges that, that Glenn has raised and that um, Andreas has raised. Yeah, if, if you can keep noting what affects each one of your interventions, and we will have a, a turn afterward. So there's a gentleman there raising the hand for, all, for a while, no, behind, yeah. Who, who is managing the microphone? Yeah, that gentleman. If you can introduce yourself briefly, please. Uh, my name is Sunil Abraham, and I'm from the Center for Internet and Society. It's a policy research organization in India. Uh, the first thing I'd like, to, I'd like to make two comments and one question. Uh, the first comment is, it's interesting what is not being said on this panel. Nobody on the panel thinks that the current IP regime interferes with the production of user-generated content on the internet. And that is quite spectacular that that is a consensus opinion of this panel. Uh, second, I really like the conflating of the myth of the individual creator, the individual innovator, the individual genius with the large mega corporation that is interested in holding more and more intellectual property. And this myth of the individual creator is being used to expand the IP regime. And uh, this is a myth that has always been used from the very beginning of uh, copyright and patent law. And it's interesting that uh, we are having a redux of that very same myth building on this panel. Uh, my question is, A, are you a believer in the multi-stakeholder model? And if your answer to that question is yes, uh, do you propose we dismantle WIPO and revoke all international uh, IP treaties and build all those treaties up from scratch using a multi-stakeholder model? Thank you very much. Challenging opening, that was the whole point. Uh, let's have another, well, we will accumulate. If you don't mind, we will accumulate because I assume that you might not be the only one as far as see in this direction. So here, here in front, yes. Thank you. Um, it has a lot to do with the previous question. Um, my, my name is Juan Carlos Solines. I'm from Ecuador. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, 
we went through a democratization process in, in terms of access to infrastructure, to uh, telecommunications, to, uh, to hardware and tools because the industry has done a great job, you know, lowering costs, uh, to applications, you know, many uh, applications are now for free. Uh, so this democratization process uh, demands, besides you know the monetization uh, issue that has to do with business models, demands uh, an adjustment of uh, the intellectual property regime. Uh, so, what do you think uh, is going to be the you know the the starting point to adjust? Besides the business models, I know that the film and the music industry has done great efforts, you know, trying to adjust uh, to the new reality. But uh, this democratization process. Uh, in which, the, as, as you may say, uh, the, the line between uh, uh, professional, uh, uh, professional um, uh, content and, uh, and user-generated content has blurred. So how the intellectual property is reacting and adjusting to this new reality? One more, and we give the floor to the panel. Who else was? OK, you are so. Thank you. Um, my name is Sven Clement. I'm from the Pirate Party of Luxembourg. And don't be scared. I will not demand the dismantlement of the WIPO, at least not today. Um, but yet you spoke a lot about respecting copyrights and how creators should be paid for their work. Now, we could discuss that statement and uh, the differing views on that, but I believe we can have a more uh, constructive uh, debate if I be a little bit more st straight to the point. Knowing that European countries don't know the concept of the fair use as it exists in the US, and knowing that there are a lot of um, big media organizations, um, TV stations, news newspapers, um, Infringing regularly on copyrights of uh, user-generated copy uh, of user-generated content uh, distributed on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and so on, um, by including that content into their own publications without clear attribution to the creator, which is in some countries still an in inalienable right, and then again also not respecting clear Creative Commons licensing that is in place to actually combat such abuse. How do you think that we can actually combat the hypocrisy of media organizations, on the one hand, using that content from small, the Mr. Garden said, unprofessional creators, and on the other hand, going after the small guys when they are infringing on their copyrights by creating Vine videos or doing screenshots of websites. So my question is actually straight to the point. How can that hypocrisy be explained? And what are possible ways to enable users to actually enforce their rights instead of the, them being bullied by the big boys? OK, we'll return to the panel. Uh, I might say that uh, to the gentleman there that you have a point. It was not exactly on the agenda of this panel to dismantle WIPO. No, not precisely. In fact, WIPO is one of the co-sponsors of, of this panel. So indeed, uh, reform, rethinking, whatever, that's exactly what we're discussing, but totally uh, destroying the idea of that copyright has a role. It's not exactly on the agenda of this panel. But anyway, I would open the floor. We, we, we are going to answer, but now let's stop the dialogue with the floor. You had your opportunity, we will go. Okay, so you start, you start answering that and we go forward. Uh, no, I don't believe in multi-stakeholder model, at least the one that is presented in ICANN in, in, in the IGF. I, I think that it's being used as a, a fig leaf. Uh, as, a, as a front uh, to to, uh, to create a, a system that that uh, thinks or offers the idea of, of uh, openness and is completely obscure and all of the decisions are made in back channels and back panels uh, somewhere by people and then get passed down and they get labeled as uh, as participation. I'm sorry, but I I. I uh, I can imagine a better system of multi-stakeholderism actually working, but not this. Not the, 
Uh, yeah, sorry. Because yeah. because sorry, no, no, but that's, a, that's an important question. Right. I, I, it's, okay. it's the most important question that anyone has asked in this panel. Sorry. So, yeah. Updating, updating IP. No, if you can, okay, but so if you want to comment on the idea of that, does, does the copyright uh, regime need an updating? The challenge about uh, the eventual hypocrisy is a word I wouldn't use, but in any case, to perhaps double standard, we could say about some media corporations uh, chasing those who infringe their own content, but uh, using other people's content, that's that's a fair claim to have uh, in terms of debate, uh, for example. Well, copyright is a... Copyright, uh, in my mind, is the price of a brain product. And uh, like anything, if you steal somebody's car or if you steal somebody's uh, watch, uh, he, he, as they can claim for it, intellectual property rights should be recognized as such. But the thing is, how do you establish that intellectual property is the big thing? If you can, we can work around and establish who owns what. And in answer to our friend's question, I mean, in the CDs, we know that you go to a high street uh, music shop and you buy a CD. The price you pay there is distributed to, with certain percentages to the distributor, to the main distributor, to the uh, lyrics writer, to the musicians who played it, etc. That can be, you don't have to sit down and write everything from scratch, but there are very good practices of distributing, sharing the revenues. That type of revenue sharing models can be created, and from that point on, uh, user-generated content can turn into a, a money-making process. You just post them up, anybody who just picks it and uses that and thinks it's worth the money they're asking for, then the system is uh, clear. I mean, that's the, that's the simple way of doing it. And that's what actually uh, Google channels are doing, really, in, in fact. Thank you. Okay, we move forward with the floor. Let me recall the figure of 11,000 replies to a debate on intellectual property reform in the times of internet. So indeed, in 10 minutes or 20 minutes, we won't solve the issue here. <laughs> it is a hot topic. And if there's one thing which cannot be said is that the topic is not that copyright reform in internet times is not on the agenda. It is, it is a totally open question whether changing, uh, dismantling WIPO, updating the laws, updating the treaties, just reinterpreting them, changing the exceptions, all that is what needs to be discussed. And of course here we are just dealing with the tip of the iceberg. I would open the floor a little bit for remote participants if they have just some contribution for those who are not here. We have a question for Sarah from Facebook from a remote participant. Um, the question is uh, related to how Facebook values its its customers or its users. Does it associate, what is the value associated with uh, each customer and it's particular to in terms of advertising? So I'm not quite sure exactly how to answer that. We, do, we don't monetize or as, assign a value to users uh, on the platform, if that's, if that's the question. I think, I think the question was in terms of advertising campaigns, so if a, com if a company was to put up advertising campaign, right. do, so how much is there a particular value to every person that hits or, t or touches them? No, I mean, that, that's not the way the platform is designed at all. So the way that advertising works on the platform is that it's, an, it's a constant auction for space. And so companies bid for that auction um, and they can, they can target it, but the, we certainly, I, w I would encourage the remote participant to, to try placing an advertisement on Facebook, and that will give them a, the, the knowledge and the information that they need. Good. So right there on the left, who, who's the macro? Yeah, the lady there. Please, if you can stand exactly, that's easier. 
Uh, I'm Katerina, Katerina Fialova from APC Association for Association for Progressive Communication. And I would like to build on the point of Sarah from Facebook about levering barriers between users and creators. Uh, which seems to me it takes more than copyrights. And especially I would like to ask about levering um, barriers between users. So it's not only the elite, as was mentioned here, elite people who can generate content. And in particular, I am referring to women's content creators, bloggers, game developers, writers, who very often face hostile and harassing uh, environment when they publish their content. So what can what else can be done there? Okay. Uh, yeah, the gentleman there by the corridor. Gürkan Öztürk from Pirate Party. First of all, I have to make my position clear that I think copyright reform must take place. Secondly, uh, my question primarily is for Nuri Çolakoğlu, which, who is uh, a prominent figure for the history of media in Turkey. Uh, I would like to ask uh, your opinion on the government's policy on the media freedom and the alcoholophobia uh, that is prevalent in Turkey and how it is affecting the critical journalists in, in the country. And in terms of content creation, uh, the effects of uh, citizen journalism platforms emerging and, uh, and this in relation with uh, media freedom levels in the country. Thank you. I think this is a very specific question, which takes us a little bit out of the thing. So if you want to comment on that, and then we return to the mainstream, so to say. But, uh very quickly, I mean, uh, in Turkey, we have an ostrich syndrome. When you dig your head into the sand, you think that you're becoming unseen. That's what the government is trying to do with the internet as well. When they ban something, like a Twitter or Facebook or something, they think that nobody can have an access to it. But we know that in Turkey, the younger generation immediately, once the Twitter was banned, they found multitude of ways of reaching out to the Twitter and getting it. And you're only banning it in Turkey, not elsewhere. So uh, it just becomes as a black mark on your human rights record or your belief in democracy. So it's a very self-inflicted wound. And uh, anyone who's intelligent to see that uh, will probably take Turkey to new horizons. Thanks. Let's be clear that I'm not reducing the importance of this topic, which I find it extraordinarily important, but it takes us a little bit out of, of, of the scope of this workshop. Uh, yes, please. Here and then. Hi, Manu Sporni. I'm the chairman of the Web Payments uh, Community Group at the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, and this is uh, there, there's a there's a question in the end here. I I didn't know if uh, any of the panelists were aware that we are actually building standards around exactly what you're talking about. So the ability to mark up content for sale on the web, the ability to express copyright and licenses associated with that content in a machine readable way that can be indexed by organizations like Google and Facebook. Um, so, so that's the first uh, item. If you didn't know that that work was happening, it is definitely happening now. And if you are interested in joining that work, please do. It's happening at the W3C. Um, the second question was uh, more about this idea of a uh, copyright registry. So, so to be clear. The problem that we're having creating these technical standards doesn't have to be doesn't have to do with the way the copyright system is is working now. It's that no one is getting involved to create the technologies to express these licenses in a machine readable way on the web. And until we have that, it's going to be very hard for small content creators to express a creative work online, express the price that they want to be paid for that creative work, and express the license that they want associated with, with that content. So 
If we have that, this idea that we need centralized copyright mechanisms or we need organizations uh, uh, tracking exactly, you know, every single copyright uh, work on the on the web kind of goes away. So the, so the question is, is, is anyone seriously pushing this idea of centralized copyright registries or do we think that all we need is a simple way to express metadata on the, on creative works on the web and a mechanism such as Google, which already exists, to go through and index stuff on a daily basis from the web. So that's a general question. Do we need a centralized mechanism or can we please move past that? That's an important one and I might jump into that. But let's take one, yeah, just one question there and we return the floor, the micro to the panel. Uh, hi, my name is Pilar Sainz from Colombia. Um, I have a concern about WIPO vision, about copyright, about the problem with limitation and acceptation and the fair use that we don't have in our country and many others. I think that to create, we need to access and to access to knowledge and to access to information. It looks like the only way that WIPO think and other, the, the, the industrial thing that we need to pay for it. And I think that there are many other needs that are not covered for this particular vision of copyright. For example, education. For example, access to knowledge in the libraries. For example, uh, access for impaired people. There are, in that moment, there is a huge discussion in WIPO about this the agenda, the positive agenda, at sometimes it looks like it's delayed. And there is a lot of discussion that is need to happen here also. And I don't see it. So my question is, it is possible a flexibilization of copyright to think in these other models? I think Okay, we, we are closing now. Uh, if you can bring up the micro here. WIPO, represented here, <laughs> will we'll reply shortly and then we, we take yes, the floor. Very the shortly, side. sorry. Yeah. Here I see my, my retirement package, health insurance sake, so I need to intervene. <laughs> very <laughs> You would allow me that. So very briefly, I think there is one important uh, consideration we need to take into account, that there is a difference between dismantling the IP framework currently administered by WIPO and dismantling WIPO itself. By dismantling WIPO, you will lose a lot of, a lot of resources devoted to the development of essential services of developing countries and at the same time you would dismantle the only international forum where we are currently discussing a copyright reform on limitation and exceptions and we are you would dismantle the only forum that have adopted a treaty establishing a mandatory limitation and exception for the visually impaired last year. So there is a difference. WIPO is changing and is changing at a fast pace. Then on the issue you mentioned between multi-stakeholderism and multilateralism, I just want to refer you to last year IGF. We had, I mean, putting at risk my work, I, I accepted an invitation that was focused on multilateralism versus multi-stakeholderism, hosted by ISOC, CCIA, uh, and uh, IFLA. And the result of that workshop, I can refer to, is that multilateralism and multi-stakeholderism are not alternatives, are actually parallel and complementary. And with that, I would like to stop because I know we are running late. Thank you. Thank you. I would comment myself on the metadata thing uh, and the comment about the metadata and the machinery. I like the I like the word just to let you know that yes, at the EU there's a lot of work going on on that. I'm sometimes I think that the standardization is not being done simultaneously. So there are different standards taking place. So there should be a standard on standards, but that's another debate which should take place. But in any case, I fully agree uh, that. Any improvement in the metadata management of online creative content 
would make a huge difference in the management of micro licensing, rights protection for user generated content creators, and so on. And that we should go much, much further into that direction before even thinking of, of big changes. Uh, in terms of copyright registry, it was a proposal. I can just say that, of course, copyright. It does is not born by registration. It's 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 it's, it's, it's pre-exists registration. It's different from patent or trademark. But anyway, so this would be my comment. Sorry, abusing for my position as as moderator. If uh, you want to add anything else, okay, on Facebook. No, you're everybody's exhausted here and jet lagged and so on. So here you go. You might surely have something to say. No. So. <laughs> having a, a very interesting conversation on Twitter actually <laughs> right now everyone jumped at me immediately like oh, wow I just told that uh, multi-stakeholderism doesn't work at IGF wow yeah <laughs> I'm getting lots of reactions on that uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, you yeah, know uh, um, uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's a topic. Uh, I think I'll, I'll repeat something to go to, to, to safe territory. Uh, 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 these are conversations uh, that uh, that we are supposed to be having, and, and, and uh, uh, I think that even though this is a, a forum where we should have, be having those conversations, there is a, sp a scope for change. Uh, whichever way you think about uh, copyright. Whether you think there is too much of it or there is not enough, and, and the tools are not working, it's. Uh, uh, I think that uh, it's. This is the perfect time for reform, whatever, and, and uh, for we we really need uh, need to start thinking about uh, about this in uh, deeper deeper questions about uh, about copyright. Thanks. <laughs> and Glenn, the final words from LA. <laughs> Um, it, you know, I found it very interesting that here in a forum that largely talks about policy, we used very technical words like metadata. Um, that's encouraging to me as an engineer. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll put out there the idea that metadata is, is what drives search and discovery and connecting people on the internet also ultimately drives things like monetization. Uh, one of the things we're missing, uh, frankly, around content is a great way of identifying it. So if I could put a plug out there for one idea, a universal content identifier would be wonderful. That would work anywhere so that I could identify the exact same piece of content, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or VK or my phone. I'd like to see that created. If I could ask for one thing, that would be it. I think that's a perfect finish. Uh, everybody would agree on that. I mean, uh, then what do we do when you find it? That's another issue. But on that, I think that's a point where everybody will agree. WIPO agrees. World Economic Forum agrees. Uh, the speakers agree. So perfect proposition to reinforce the investment and development of metadata on identification of content online. And. Uh, so, so if I may, uh, a big thanks to everyone, and I, I think you can agree with us that it was fair, a fairly energetic conversation. Um, so uh, just a sort of last words, this is an ongoing project that we have at the World Economic Forum, and we'll be running workshops and conversations you know, in person and virtually uh, throughout the year. So if you're interested in sort of getting in touch, please see me afterwards. And just for the record, the, the World Economic Forum is an organization based on the multi-state Stakeholder approach. So, thanks very much. <laughs>